Welcome to another edition of the program. My name is Mike Saunders, and once again I will be your host and moderator for today's discussion on sustainability. A sample of research studies released during 2014 contains some rather damning information. Plant and animal species are becoming extinct at least a thousand times faster than they did before humans arrived on the scene. Carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere reached a record high last year, 2013. Mercury levels in much of the world's oceans are double to triple what they were before the Industrial Revolution. These and other studies point to human activity as being a major contributor to this breakdown of our environment. There are more and more calls these days for us to lead sustainable lives. But what exactly is a sustainability-led life? Let's explore that concept in the discussion today. Joining us in the studio are Liette Fasseur, Professor in the Department of Biological Sciences, Ian Brindle, Professor in the Department of Chemistry, and Diane DuPont, Professor in the Department of Economics. And we say welcome to you all today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we're, we're pleased to be here. Let's go first around the table and find out each participant's definition or description of sustainability from uh, the point of view of your own particular research or discipline. First of all, let's hear from Ian. Okay. Um, for me, sustainability um, uh, equates uh, with uh, conservation. Uh, one of the problems that we have <clears throat> is that we uh, continually uh, overuse the resources that are available to us uh, and so we, uh, we end up uh, running short of, of things in a number of different ways. Uh, 500 years ago um, there was a guy called Georgius Agricola and um, he recommended closing mines down where they mined metals so that the, the veins of ores would grow again. So it's a bit of a naive idea that the earth is an organism and that it would restore uh, the metals back into the, uh, into the mines by basically regrowing the veins. Um, <clears throat> it's a nice idea and of course it doesn't quite work that way. You use them up. When I was in high school uh, and I learned about the chemistry of copper, uh, I discovered that copper was mined in uh, northern Ontario from huge boulders that weighed hundreds of tons of pure copper. These days, a good copper ore contains around 1 to 2 percent. So we're looking at a very different world than we were a long time ago, uh, actually a long time in my age. Um, <clears throat> but certainly, I think the, the idea of uh, sustainability has to recognize, built into the idea of sustainability is conservation, so that we can not uh, over-exploit the resources which are significantly limited. Okay, and Liette? Uh, I think I would add, uh, I, I like the idea of conservation, but I think it's important also to realize that we have to continue to have future generation to meet their needs. And uh, when we look at that, is to see but how can we uh, better uh, do our activities that lead to some reduction of uh, and overexploitation of the resources making sure that uh, the resources that are renewable are capable to be renewable because in many cases like fish reefs we're overfishing so it's uh, not necessarily uh, give them a chance to replenish and also at the same time uh, understand that there's connection between all the components of uh, the system so that humans need the ecosystem so if the ecosystem is depleted, it's not going to be healthy for human, uh, human survival. So there's really this interconnection between the two. So you have to make sure that communities can survive, but also all the other organisms on Earth can survive in an ecosystem that is healthy. Okay, and Diane? Um, I'd like to pick up a little bit on what both Ian and Diet said. Um, I'm an economist, and so I guess I, I would step back for a second and say, when we use the word sustainability, there's a missing noun there. What's what's the noun? What is it we're trying to make sustainable? And Liette mentioned communities, and certainly that's one aspect of it. I think Ian's notion perhaps might be more the ecosystem resources, resources per se. 
And from an economic point of view, I think we'd encompass both of those things. Normally what we think about is sustainable development. And that's a bit of a challenge because on the one hand, sustainable often means stasis, no change. But development implies change. And we know that there has been a lot of change in our economic activities. And so the question becomes then, how do we have a sustainable economy? And for an economist, that would be basically the challenges, challenge of achieving some kind of economic growth given the ecological constraints, so given the environmental, given the resource constraints. And this is very much in the vein of the Brentland Commission definition from, and Liette kind of mentioned it, uh, I guess it's now almost 30 years old, um, where they talked about development that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So there's a sense of the environment, the resources, somehow supporting human life, human activity. And I think that's, to me, the notion of sustainability. How do we develop, and more importantly, maintain a sustainable society when many of us are brought up with the concept of cheaper means more and more is better? Is this the so-called Walmartization of society where we just toss something out, buy another one because it's cheaper and easier to do that than worry about uh, the complications? Okay, I'll jump in on that one. <clears throat> Um, one of the things, and, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to poach on Diane's territory here, but um, one of the things that I think needs to be thought about is, um, in um, particularly in industries, is total cost accounting for um, activities. A number of years ago, I was at a conference in in Washington, <coughs> where one of the speakers was a vice president of Procter and Gamble. And he was talking about sustainability in a way that I thought uh, very interesting. So in terms of uh, producing consumer products, whether it's detergent or whether it's uh, paper towels or whatever it is, um, they uh, tried to do a total cost accounting for this. And uh, so they looked at, take, take a, as an example, uh, a detergent like Tide. You can now buy cold water Tide and one of the reasons for that was in their total cost accounting, the amount of waste generated, the major amount of waste generated, use it in doing uh, your family wash, is actually the waste that's generated by heating the water that you use. So the notion that you actually want to include that into the equation of how you use a detergent um, cha rad radically changed the way that they thought about, uh, about detergents and that gave rise to the de development of cold water tide. Obviously you're saving um, in terms of energy um, it, so that uh, that became the major uh, driving force uh, for that. Um, I'd certainly echo what Ian has to say. Full cost accounting is um, a general principle that economists would argue about. The idea, of course, is that whenever we use resources, there are costs that are explicit to our resources. We may have to pay for them, but there may be costs that we don't, that we as individuals do not bear, but that society as a group bears, so-called externalities. And by including those externalities, we can adjust the consumption levels. It doesn't mean they go to zero, it doesn't mean pollution goes to zero, but it means basically balancing the benefits and the costs of the use of the resource, the, the cost being, of course, potentially pollution, the benefits being the benefits that consumers get from using the good. So certainly, f for economists, we would argue that what is missing is pricing to consumers. So at the end of the day, the consumers should be seeing the full cost, the full price of the good that they're purchasing. And maybe to pick up a little bit more on Ian's point, it's, it's one thing to think about the costs associated with the use of the product, there's an additional cost, which is the cost of the disposal of the packaging that comes with the product. And in Canada, we're not at all far along with that. We've got recycling programs and things, but that doesn't stop, or doesn't rather encourage producers to think about different ways of packaging their products. At the end of the week, I'm always stunned at the amount of plastic containers I have from the fruit that I buy, and I duly recycle it, but I have to think to myself, there must be a a better way of doing this. Mm -hmm. And if I had to, you know, face, if I had to pay a higher price, for example, for disposing of that plastic, I'd think twice about buying those products. Mm -hmm. I think the other challenge that uh, we have also in the, in the cost diver is the equity. 
and uh, how uh, there are other impacts that we don't necessarily see either on the ecosystem itself because we are extracting or we are doing something else but also on humans uh, and communities because many of the products now are not necessarily produced here in Canada but they are produced in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and um, we, well, we have heard more recently because of disasters uh, the, uh, the impact on these communities but uh, what it means also in terms of equity uh, and how uh, it's sometimes a question of labor, it's a question of environment, it's a question also of uh, uh, even cultural and religious, uh, in some cases, impact, because we are changing the way that they are doing it. And uh, for me, uh, a good example was when I was in the Amazon in Ecuador, and uh, we stopped in a small village that they just had opened a year before uh, the road through the Amazon, and uh, that um, they are losing their traditional, <coughs> uh, their traditional culture, their uh, the way that they were preparing and traditional food, traditional beverage, because now that the ro road is coming, they tend to buy beer, chips, chocolate, all these things that are prefab. So it, these are impacts that we don't necessarily can mark economically but are quite profound in terms of losing their tradition, their history, uh, and all what made their culture at the beginning. There are actually ways within economics to do what's called non-market valuation, mm -hmm. so that would be exactly your point. Many, many impacts within an economy are not necessarily traded in a market, so we don't really have a, pipe, yeah, a, co a, ca a cost true. accounting, shall we say. <coughs> Nonetheless, these impacts are felt, and so the question becomes when we're making policy decisions, we need to have that information to do the full cost accounting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We need to have some estimate of what these so-called non-market impacts might be in terms of losses, losses to the ecosystem, for example. So when uh, the Exxon Valdez in 1998 ran a grant in Alaska, mm -hmm. there was a loss of ecosystem values, a degradation of the ecosystem. And that was an interesting case because it was one of the first cases in which um, Exxon was taken to court by the state of Alaska and they needed some basis for assessing the damages and they turned to non-market valuation as a way of at least getting at some narrowing the range of values that we might expect to see for what the loss of the what the cost of that loss might be so mm -hmm. certainly there there are ways of getting at that and I always tell my students when they look at me and they go well you can't value a you know, a life, a reduction in a life. And I say, well, you'd rather put some value on it rather than a zero value, which is implicitly what we are doing many times when we don't incorporate mm -hmm. those into our accounting. And I think it would be a wake-up call for many individuals to understand what really is the impact of when, when they buy something. Uh, I think most people are so materialistic now that they don't necessarily understand they will have you know, one day a phone and then they will buy a new mobile fi phone the next day because they don't like the first one. And understanding the impacts of not only buying that phone, but also the disposal, as you said, mm -hmm. and all that would be interesting. It's interesting. There are a number of um, online calculators mm -hmm. that will kind of measure your impact or your footprint yeah. on the economy. And I remember, I think when my son was about grade 10, he came home with one of these things and kind of did his little impact assessment. But the problem then becomes, how do you how do you instill that notion into a society where social norms are encouraging people to some extent to, con to buy things, to buy newer things, to buy more recent models? And, and if we don't face the explicit cost of the disposal, it's a, we're not doing the right kind of calculation, if you will. Mm -hmm. That's a problem, yeah. I think one of the, <coughs> one of the other uh, areas is, is uh, it, was, it was defined, I think, by Henry Regeer at the University of Toronto a number of years ago, and certainly mentioned by Ursula Franklin in her book, The Real World of Technology, which is this term, domains of ignorance, which I think uh, it, we encounter all the time, certainly I encounter it a lot because of the work that I do in the environment, um, is the um, development of things without, without an awareness of the 
long-range impact. So it's the, it's the other side of total cost accounting. It's the unexpected, uh, the things that you don't anticipate happening. So, for example, um, one of the best examples that I know is when you're building a refrigerator and you want an efficient refrigerator, you're not inclined to think about the impact of that refrigerant on the ozone layer in the upper atmosphere. Uh, it's too far away, it's, it's, uh, it's too bizarre. And of course you sometimes don't find, about, find out about it until the cat's out of the bag, the toothpaste out of the tube, whatever it is that you want to say. The uh, ozone depleting chemicals are up there in the, in the upper atmosphere. And then you have to deal with that problem. Um, and these domains of ignorance are, are everywhere. The flame retardants that I analyze in the Great Lakes uh, were put, were, are, are there because people don't want their computers, their night dresses, their, their furniture um, to burn. So they put flame retardants in them and those flame retardants have health impact. They also accumulate in the environment uh, and in fish and so on and so on and so on. So there's another domain of ignorance where these things are now moving up into the Arctic and being found in the breast milk of people in unlikely places like the east coast of Baffin Island. Mm -hmm. What I find fascinating about your notion of domains of ignorance, and I, I definitely agree with you, is it seems to me that our ability to measure what might be an adverse outcome is getting better and better. And so to what extent at the, at the point of time at which a product or a, a development is made, it may be that our ability to detect those adverse reactions is just not there. So mm -hmm. it, to me, it's a, a really big question of, well, how do we then set in place a set of in, in, you know, institutions that would somehow encourage people to perhaps delay, to you know mm -hmm. gather the old precautionary principle, to gather a little bit more information, to wait. Mm -hmm. There's every... I would say there's every emphasis not to do that in terms of um, the way R and D is done, and and so the question becomes how do we how do we in encourage that degree? Now we would argue in economics there's a missing market, but that you know there there's kind of a um, not all of the outcomes can be bought and sold in a market. If they would be, then it would be advantageous for people to find out what the costs were, what the adverse impacts are, and and to kind of think about that and take it into their decision making. The, the problem I think in many cases, and uh, that reminded me of uh, the presentation of Barry Comer in 1999 when I was in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, it was my first time with the North American Commission for uh, Environmental Cooperation. And um, he presented the results in which they have put uh, the cultural maps of the Eskimos and Inuits in the Arctic. and what type of species of fish, plants, etc. they were eating and where they were. And they had a team of uh, biologists and chemists who took specimens to be able to measure the level of dioxin in each of these mm -hmm. different organisms. And um, one thing that he, he mentioned at the time that uh, still struck me uh, is the fact that what we think is okay at one point. And sometimes, even if we have a precautionary principle uh, of saying, okay, we need to look at it probably over the next few years to see if there are cumulative effect. In the case of dioxin, it took a little bit longer than expected to be able to be detectable, but it has huge health impact at mm -hmm. the same time. And this mm -hmm. is why finally, uh, through NAFTA and uh, the uh, parallel agreement in environmental cooperation, the three countries prepared the North American action plan to reduce the accent. But it's something that, uh, as I said, it, it was something that is, it's a drip by drip system that takes a long time to detect. Mm -hmm. But when we start detecting mm -hmm. it, it's already too late. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. the challenge. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good point. I think one of the things, uh, and it touches on what you were saying, is, is the techniques for measuring things, um, whether it's dioxins or uh, the example that I'm going to use is, uh, is arsenic. Mm. Um, we know that arsenic uh, is in the groundwater in countries like Bangladesh, mm. uh, and um, the uh, toxic level, or at least the, the level that's been set by the World Health Authority, uh, for arsenic in drinking water is 10 parts per billion. 
we could not measure, nobody could measure 10 parts per billion until probably 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So people didn't know. Pe you know, it's another one of those uh, interesting domains. Um, and uh, I was just at a conference uh, last week in Scotland uh, where the number of arsenic species and the toxicity of those species is only now being unraveled because, of course, it's, uh, arsenic is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Um, and uh, depending on how you take it in, it's more or less toxic. And so, the, uh, you know, obviously, you know, for the people who come after me as analytical chemists, there's a future for analytical chemists because those barriers continue to be pushed back as we better understand uh, what the uh, toxic effects of various things are. Mm -hmm. And I saw the same thing with Kenyon, for example, in uh, around Kichimekujik National Park, that uh, they detected the levels being too high compared to the normal drinking water standard, mm -hmm. to discover by the end that it was natural Kenyon, and that people always been living with mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. rate forever. But uh, it, it's a question of understanding what does it really mean in terms of... Uh, the health of the ecosystem, if it's an ecosystem that has been adjusting to that for so long. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really good point, because that gets back to the notion of sustainability. So mm -hmm. what is it that's being sustained? In mm -hmm. this case, it's a series of organisms or a series of people. May, they, they may not look the same 100 years from now, but we would argue that it is a sustainable community or whatever. Just they've adjusted to their environment and they've changed. Mm -hmm. I think there's, there's, there, there are other examples of that. So in, in South Africa, where there's a, 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 an ore of, of uh, uranium thorium called monocyte sand, um, it's, it occurs in Southern Africa. Um, it's relatively radioactive. And so the, the, the bush, bushmen of, of South Africa have had their, bushmen and bushwomen obviously, have had their genitalia exposed to uh, radiation mm -hmm. for generation after generation, which probably does something in terms of evolutionary pressure mm -hmm. uh, that has, has probably changed that group of, of people relative to, to others because of exposures. And the same thing with cadmium, the same thing mm -hmm. with arsenic, you know, particular niche areas in the world where there are particular hazards to which people have adapted unknowingly uh, to be able to cope with those uh, those consequences. Perhaps adaptability or resilience is the, mm -hmm. the right buzzword to use in the context of sustainability. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it, it allows for a change to the circumstances. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important, yeah, I like the idea of uh, the resilience component because in fact uh, when we look at sustainability we have to remember that all ecosystem, everything on Earth, has always been changing and will continue to change. That it's succession for our forests, or that it's because of a disturbance or something else. There always changes, and that's normal. Now, the, the, the question is, especially for human sustainability, it's a question of knowing how we're capable of adapting to these new conditions. And it means sometimes that communities will have to transform themselves to continue to be resilient. And I see that a lot, uh, especially with coastal communities, mm -hmm. um, which have to face more and more extreme events. And, um, and we have a lot of erosion on the coast now in some places. So they have to realize that the community that they had 200, 300 years ago may not be the same exactly. in 10 years or 20 years from now. There's another interesting example of that, which is not at all really environmental, but interesting. Route 66, the famous route in, uh, in the States that goes from, is it Chicago to Los Angeles, I think it is, used to be a very thriving route. It had restaurants, hotels, etc., all along the side. People lived there. And then, of course, with the advent of flying, not everyone drove the route. And so now there are entire ghost towns mm -hmm. along that route. People have had to adapt, move away. It's either you move away or you have to transform what mm -hmm. you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that as well. And in some way we saw it with uh, the cod fishery mm -hmm. and its collapse. Mm -hmm. uh, that some communities completely closed door and other communities have to find ways uh, either through tourism, either through uh, other type of fisheries to be able to survive. 
Right. And so in economics, we would use the notion of uh, substitutability. So mm -hmm. in other words, things don't need to stay static. You can adjust, you can modify, you can alter, you can substitute one thing for another. Mm -hmm. I think uh, one of the things, of course, that uh, is, is the 600 pound gorilla in the room, of course, is, is that human beings are very clever. <laughs> um, we're very clever at adapting to our environment in ways that other creatures are not. Um, and um, so uh, you take, I know, uh, for example, at the moment uh, in St. Catharines, um, the, the house finch mm -hmm. is, uh, it has got, undergone a population explosion, mm -hmm. yeah. which it did a number of years ago. Uh, and suddenly it's like the bats. There's, an, there's a, a fungus which is turning these finches blind. That mm -hmm. population is going to collapse. So you get this growth and collapse, growth and collapse. Human beings have managed to survive without collapsing. Um, Although individual societies have collapsed. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's that, uh, I mean, the, the, this book called Collapse, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, by Jared Diamond, Diamond. Yeah. Um, which speaks to, to that. Um, but, the, you know, th those are often at the periphery mm -hmm. of, of what we call the civilized world. Uh, you know, and um, I think this, the scary thing—it's—it's it's like how do you how do you deal with climate change? We, you know, we we may argue about whether climate change is natural, whether it's artificial. It really, doesn't matter. The climate is changing, um, and uh, how are we adapting to it? Well, one of the ways that we adapt to it, if we want to live in these uh, horrible, uncomfortable, hot or cold places, is that we heat it up or cool it down mm -hmm. because we have the means of doing so. Um, which exacerbates the problem. <laughs> which exacerbates the problem. We've, we've not, you know, for us, sustainability um, is is uh, is very very different from that idea of conservation. It's basically, you know, sustaining our lives such as such as they are um, at the expense of, of conservation. Uh, you know, Barry Commoner obviously is is very much attuned with that idea. Mm -hmm. Do people really realize? how fragile our present ecosystem really is? That's a very good question. I would say that uh, in general, people probably do not realize very well what's happening. Uh, in, in probably big part because we have disconnected quite a lot our lives from the natural environment. Uh, and uh, it's quite obvious now that uh, having just done a field course recently to see that uh, most students have not, and they are biology students, but most of them have not been too much in a uh, forested ecosystem, having to deal with uh, biodiversity. Uh, it's, it's kind of surprising, but uh, it's unfortunate to see that uh, we have became such a, a world of uh, electronics and uh, being inside that we forget about what is our ecosystem, the natural ecosystem. Yeah, so if we, uh, there's a, a wonderful example of, of uh, people not considering uh, the fragility of their environment, and that is the people of Easter Island, um, mm -hmm. who um, found, they, they independently, obviously, from wherever they came, they came to Easter Island um, in, in boats, proceeded to chop down all the trees, and then they couldn't get off. Um, and you know, there, there's a, a, the perfect example of, of absolutely not conserving your resources, throwing uh, the baby out with the bathwater, as it were, and then being stuck. No wonder those statues look so miserable all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'd echo what Liette has to say. It, it's interesting because I think in some ways we have an interesting kind of dichotomy here. On the one hand, I think the general level of science background of the average person is great enough now to have a better sense of a holistic view of how our actions affect the ecosystem. But in some senses, because we're wealthier now, we almost want to isolate or insulate ourselves from environmental effects and from the environment in general. You know, Ian was talking earlier about people overheating their houses or, or cooling their houses in order to get the right kind of temperature. And to a large extent we do that and so then we lose that kind of feedback mechanism that would tell us, oh maybe we better need, we need to think about this. So it's it's a it's a real dilemma I think. We have a better understanding but on the other hand it's like we don't want to have we don't think it belong it matters to us. And you know as an economist again uh, I would turn to the fact that 
when people make decisions, they're only looking at how the outcome will affect themselves and mm -hmm. they don't think about what the implications might be for all of the other multi-billion people on the planet. It's probably a question that we are becoming desensitized of uh, I think what's to some happening. extent. That's true. And uh, and working in developing countries, uh, I remember very well uh, my first project in China uh, that uh, I was talking to a journalist after working in a community meeting on a development of uh, a coastal area, and she said, "But and and she said directly to me, but we want to be like you." Mm -hmm. And talking about North America and having a lot of cars, a lot of uh, large industries, uh, very nice stuff, and and uh, and that for her because it was a rural community, it was poor, it was not functional, because they don't necessarily look at the environment. They were looking more at the development part. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a kind of a uh, you know a setback to to that they want. They don't want to be connected to their environment. And at the same time, we have to remember that um, it's not all cultures that are necessarily uh, connecting to the environment the same way. And uh, another good example for me is when I was in Burkina Faso in West Africa, and uh, I had a translator for the, co the communities, the rural communities we were working with. And um, I was talking with them about the, the fragile environment and that their environment uh, you know, probably was very important for them. And the translator stopped and he said, you know what, we're having a little problem here. I said, why? He said, but the word environment does not exist for the, the Maori mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. So for them, the environment is is not something that they consider because it's part of them. Mm -hmm. I think you see this. Uh, I remember a case a few years ago where I think it was somebody, in, uh, an anthropologist in Brazil, uh, going into uh, a, a community where they'd never seen white folks before, or, or uh, you know, any any quote uh, civilized uh, person. Um, so they were bemused by the camera uh, that mm -hmm. the, the guy had mm -hmm. and said, show me how to make that. Because of course for them, everything that they have, they make from the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and the notion that you'd actually not know how to make something it, it was, was, uh, it was ridiculous. You know, how could you not know how to make this? You're using it. So, you know, and I, I, I think that that's a, quite, a, quite a, an interesting view on your one's relationship to the environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now there's there's a move towards ecotourism to educate the masses about the fragility of the ecosystem. But can that ultimately do more harm than good, do you think? Oh absolutely. I was going to mention something about that earlier when Liat was talking uh, about um, communities that are perhaps less developed than ours. The idea, of course, is that uh, if one travels, or if too many people travel, and I, won't, I don't know how to define too many, uh, if too many people travel to a particularly fragile but beautiful location, then they may end up damaging the location and, and altering altering it because we know that things are not static, they change. Um, I'm a big fan of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and I don't know if anybody else is, but <laughs> there was the lovely planet of Magrathea, and you had to get a ticket if you went to the bathroom. So. <laughs> That's a real case of, of having mm -hmm. a closed system. <laughs> well, I, th I think that's the problem that uh, the Galap Galapagos Islands are, are having right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. because it's such a destination uh, for tourists that they're uh, they are getting increasingly concerned about the uh, the impact of the tourists on on that ecosystem. Um, and you know, it's um, um, a, it's a sort of different statement of uh, of the uncertainty principle. You know. I, the observer has a clear impact on the observed, and I think that uh, to pretend that you don't is ridiculous. Uh, you know, because you go there, you you generate this idea. You know, so if you have no idea of environment, suddenly you want to tell people about it. If you have a camera, somebody wants to know how you make it, and so on. So that those make huge differences, huge impacts 
Uh, and you were saying earlier about the, uh, you know, you put the road through the, through uh, Brazil, through the Amazon, and suddenly people people want to have chocolate and chips and things like that, and now you need uh, dental care uh, mm -hmm. and all of those things that you never had before. Uh, so there, there are um, enormous impacts that, uh, that I think are incalculable. Mm -hmm. They change the world as we know. And in some cases, people think that they are doing the right thing by doing ecotourism, for example. And uh, one example is the uh, legend of Buktush, the uh, Irving Eco Center in, uh, in Buktush, uh, that uh, the Irving family paid to make sure that there was a very nice boardwalk and some interpretation of what is sand dune and all that kind of stuff. And they realized after a while, however, uh, that uh, they had their own impact on their environment, especially when they started having storm surges. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they had one in January 2000, another one in October 2000, uh, Gustavo in 2002. So they, they started increasing, and each time they were trying to rebuild. And over time, they realized we probably are not doing a good service for the sand dune because mm -hmm. the sand dune is getting uh, damaged by not only the storm, but the fact that we're rebuilding each mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So the interpretation uh, is not necessarily about the natural environment, but the impact of human in the mm -hmm. environment mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah, and that sort of mistaken idea of conservation resulting in forest fires and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, um, and as Tivy the Milkman said, there's always another hand, um, you look at uh, the redwood forests and Douglas fir um, preservation areas in, in California. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have those, there probably wouldn't be a redwood tree left in California. Yeah. They would have been chopped down and, and turned into lumber. Um, so that there's a, there's a fine balance that we have to find between uh, exploitation and conservation. I'm glad you said the word balance, because <laughs> that's what that's what we would worry about in, in terms of economics. There's the, there are the benefits of educating people and making sure that they're sensitive to uh, nuances of the kinds of actions that they may have on the environment. But on the other hand, there are the potential costs associated with their altering the mm -hmm. environment in a way that makes it more fragile. Mm -hmm. And we have to always remember each time that we step somewhere, we make an impact, mm -hmm. that we want it or not. Uh, the thing is, we, we still want, you know, especially the children, to go outside and experience nature. Uh, so we know that at one point they will have some impact. It's to understand, but what really do we want in terms of impact? And that uh, reminds me of the field course and, uh, when uh, in Kijimakuji National Park in Nova Scotia when we established the uh, biodiversity plots. We had a uh, team of 12 high school students to help. Mm -hmm. The red, nice mature red spruce for us have a lot of moss in terms of crown vegetation. And it's a fragile system. Uh, I can't say that I was discouraged after a full week of having 12 students trampling and trampling and trampling on the moss that probably took around 20, 50 years mm -hmm. to grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, this is when you realize you want you do the biodiversity plots to try to understand cons you know biodiversity and try to help for conservation issues, but at the same time each step causes other damage. So it's always the, the famous balance. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember uh, a, not a long time ago now. Um, I uh, I worked at McMaster University and I lived in Dundas, um, and every every morning at least when when the weather was appropriate. I walked up the railway tracks from Dundas to, uh, to McMaster um, and the, um, the snapping turtles came mm -hmm. out of uh, uh, Coots Paradise to mm -hmm. lay their eggs along the railroad track. Uh, and of course there was a road that had been installed that ran around and down into Dundas from McMaster. And every spring the snapping turtles were killed on that road. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, you'd, you'd find corpses and eggs and, and things like that. And you, you, you think, you know, uh, so here is, you know, in terms of, uh, of conservation, uh, what do you need? Why didn't people think about this? Why didn't they explore 
uh, the area and realize that uh, the snapping turtles need the right kind of environment in which to lay their eggs, why didn't they put some kind of tunnels underneath the, uh, the road and force the, uh, the uh, turtles to go underneath the road instead of on top of it where all the cars are coming by and, and probably decimating that population. Actually, there's an interesting example of where that has been done, and that's out in Banff, mm -hmm. in the National Park. Mm -hmm. And they have over the highway Passage. kind of passageways, and they've, they've seeded them with plants and things like that. And the intention, of course, is that these will be the natural pass passageways for the deer mm -hmm. and whatnot. I remember my kids going under one of such passage, and they said, well, how are the deer supposed to know where to go? <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> we're kind of herding them into a particular location. Uh -huh. And they're a very good example also of the highway between Halifax and Moncton, that the highways are a bit elevated so that the, the moose can pass, and they have their mm -hmm. underpass in this mm -hmm. case, uh, that uh, they are funneled through the, 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 over, the underpass to be able to go on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite interesting, but what is interesting with turtles, and um, that reminds me again of Keji, uh, Keji Makujik National Park and the blending turtle, is that uh, gradually Tom Herman at uh, Acadia University discovered that they liked to lay their eggs along the side of the road in the gravel, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it's warm and all that. And we created, in fact, the problem by having this gravel mm. where they, they lay their eggs. So at that point, they had to put sign to make sure that people don't park there so that their cars would collapse the mm -hmm. nest. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, this is the thing, is they, they were always been used to lay their eggs in certain places. But because suddenly we give, gave them a new type of substrate that they like, we created the problem of having them not capable of surviving very well. Mm -hmm. So it's always the, uh, the fa famous challenge of figuring out when we do something, what could be the other impact on the other organisms mm -hmm. at the same time. Okay, well let's finish our discussion by going around the table once again and each participant can offer their thoughts on how we can each in our own way contribute to a more sustainable life. And we'll wrap up uh, the program with uh, these thoughts. And we'll begin this time with uh, Liette. Oh, uh, there are many ways I think that uh, everybody can help. Uh, and it's to just be more conscious of what we're doing in everyday life uh, when we buy things, why we buy certain things. Just even reflecting on that can help quite a lot. Uh, so, many, we, so many times we just true things without realizing. So it's really a question of reflection. And I think it will be very important, not only for us now, but uh, for uh, in the near future, we are uh, at the end of the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable, uh, sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we already, and I should say, uh, being last week in Ottawa, uh, the post-2015 is certainly discussed a lot right now because we have to realize that we have not met the goals, many of them, and we'll have to figure out how we want to be more sustainable, considering that we had already some challenges to meet the first goals. Okay, and for Diane? I would echo what uh, Leah has to say, certainly uh, in terms of being mindful. I guess I'd like to think about what we're really talking about is how can we encourage people to take the environment into their everyday accounting of the choices that they make. And in a very broad brush, and I apologize to all people on the planet, in a very broad brush we can think about people who might be a bit altruistic. In other words, when they make their decisions, they're, they're thinking a little bit about other people. And so they're the people like Liette who are being reflective and thinking, I ought to do this, even though the incentive structure and outside there may not really be set up to encourage her to do that. So in that type of people, perhaps educational campaigns are, are useful kinds of things or indoc you know, telling children at a very young age, giving them a better sense of how the ecosystem works together. And then there are people, of course, who are more self-interested in terms of their decisions and for them, I think we need institutional types of changes to bring about full cost of pr um, pricing. To, to give the right incentives to people because at the end of the day I think if you were to categorize what we've been doing we've essentially been 
using resources with, without paying the full cost of those uses. And so that means that we have pollution, we have overuse, we may even have in some cases um, run the, the stocks to the ground. And finally, the last word goes to Ian. I'd like to pick up on what <clears throat> Diane was saying, particularly um, I think kids are, um, are the place where this begins. The, the Blue Box program um, that um, was introduced now a number of, I, I think a lot of people, uh, especially younger people, don't even know when that began. Um, but it began uh, not that long ago. Um, and one of the major movers of that was the young children in schools who basically went home and, and upbraided their parents for wanting to throw tin cans out instead of putting them in the recycling bin. Um, and I think that, um, I, I think that's, you want, if you're going to build a culture, and I think that's what we've all three been talking about, is a culture um, that really understands what conservation and sustainability really means. Um, it is an educational process. We all need to understand just what it is uh, that we're doing on this planet and the harm that we do if we choose to ignore those things. And I think that um, one of the things that I think young people need to do is to be aware that they can demand a better world uh, and expect that their demands will be met. Okay, thank you all very much for coming in and uh, may we all lead more sustainable lives in the future. Thank you all for being in the studio today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.